Wow. It's pretty cool, actually. Uh, and I'm glad I came here because the first thing that I'm going to do when I leave is I'm going to apply for a job with Billy Cohen. Uh, I need... <laughs> And wow, uh, what he's doing. So what I've done, it pales in comparison to Billy, but uh, you have to see his magic tricks. I don't know if you've seen uh, any of those yet. His magic tricks are just as uh, compelling and convincing as, uh, as his talk uh, was today. So this is a privilege for me. I'm going to talk about uh, navigating the maze of medical device development. If you believe I know anything about that, I'm sorry, you're really kind of mistaken. Uh, maybe you came uh, to the wrong talk. It's too complex. Uh, I can tell you about, uh, oh great, thanks, about at least an approach uh, to, uh, uh, to working your way through a medical device development. I do need to clear up one thing though. I did not flunk out of Texas Tech. Uh, <laughs> I, we need to get that, I think this now is time to get that addressed. Uh, I transferred uh, the day before I got my letter of in academic in eligibility to Ohio State. <laughs> just want to set the record straight that, I, uh, that I'm, uh, I'm a Red Raider, uh, let's say, but I did not uh, actually flunk out. So, um, you know, I think we are all uh, need to know that uh, as we navigate through this maze that there will be surprises and you have to stay alert. And there will be things that will happen to you that would be shocking, unanticipated. Um, and and as, as Billy said, you know, you, we're, our obligation is really to kind of work through those. So I just think we need to put everything in perspective. Donald Rumsfeld, uh, you may remember him from the past, uh, but he was kind of an uh, intellectual kind of a guy. And he said, reports that say something hasn't happened are always interesting to me because, as we know, there are known knowns. Things we know, we know. We also know there are known unknowns, things we say we know, that there are some things we do not know. But, uh, most interesting of course, uh, for sure also there are the unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know we don't know. <laughs> so I am an example of the, of the unknown unknowns. Uh, but I think what, I, what has separated me from some of my uh, other colleagues is that I'm willing uh, to do what Billy uh, said earlier today, I'm willing to take a chance, uh, you know, to kind of try to, to, and particularly try to meet unmet clinical needs. And that's really been sort of maybe kind of, I don't know if it's been my strength, but it's been something I've been, uh, let's say, sort of obsessed with. But we have a lot of doctors, I guess, here in the uh, So everybody's a physician. Raise your hand just to, so I can identify who are going to be the victims of this question. Um, <laughs> Well, so this is a, the, uh, the histology from an autopsy. Uh, and this patient uh, that died had a normal cholesterol, had a normal blood pressure, was a non-smoker, did not have diabetes, had some plus minus family history for vascular disease. But these are the histology that has been taken here would be taken from the three most important coronary arteries on the top of this patient's heart. And this... Uh, Let's have a pointer here, or no, is that? Well, the, the one, on, the big one on, on the, uh, kind of in the center on the left, all of that artery has been filled up with plaque, and there's a little bitty hole down in the bottom right, and that's where the blood goes. So there's no real room for very much blood. And same thing on the, that's called a diagonal branch over the other side, uh, no room for blood there. And so, you know, I think we could all agree, particularly the physicians, I think, here would agree that this probably came from an elderly patient. Are we kind of agreeing on that or I'm safe? In? Yeah. Or if not an elderly patient, then a, a young patient, but would have had high cholesterol, high blood pressure, would have had to have a lot of risk factors for, for vascular disease um, f to end up in this situation. But I think what we can for sure agree on universally out here is that this could not have come from an Olympic athlete. Probably somebody very sedentary in terms of their lifestyle, right? Suckered you into it really, really easily there. That wasn't even very hard for the doctors here. So these, this autopsy came from uh, Sergey Grinkoff who's the Olympic skater that died on the ice, uh, warming up for the 19, what was it, uh, 96, maybe Olympics, I've kind of forgotten the day. He was having chest pain during the warm up, 
Uh, and you can see why it would have chest pain, because it, all these arteries are, are, are almost closed. Uh, and he got shots in his shoulder because the pain radiated to his shoulder. So he was getting lidocaine injections and steroid injections in his shoulder after each practice. Steroid injections are not an effective therapy for coronary artery disease that have closed off all of your, uh, all of your arteries. I mean, just, you know, it's a, maybe sort of one of the basic medical principles. He, uh, he's a victim, though, of sort of accepting, I don't know, kind of the standard, of course, he, he, he can't have coronary disease. And, um, and I think that that's why we all, we all need to keep sort of imagining, you know, to have better solutions for these problems. And he should have had a treadmill test or something. There are a lot of ways to find out what he really was having, um, which was, those were actually ignored. So I want to do what Billy did a little bit. I just want to kind of tell my story, and then you can, uh, uh, we can, you can think about this as half as a little bit crazy. So I'm at the bottom on the bottom left, Clyde. I'm the guy with the really white teeth, and uh, <laughs> so I've been to the dentist. Uh, we did just get back from the tanning salon too, so we we really do all look pretty good. So the guy on the far back corner with the holding his head, thinking, "Oh my God." Uh, that's Andreas Grunzig, and I don't know if m many of you might know the name of Andreas Grunzig, but he's really the father of all of, uh, of vascular percutaneous intervention, uh, in a way. So he was the first person ever to put a balloon catheter in a coronary artery uh, in a patient uh, and open up a coronary artery and help that, help that patient avoid bypass surgery. So we had a... Uh, I, I, was, I had the opportunity to go to uh, this particular conference in Zurich that time. We had a little bit of wine, which also explains maybe the red face. I thought showing the wine picture would be good because we're in the wine country. So you see, the, oh, geez. Uh, uh, brilliant. I, I thought you would say brilliant, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Chianti, I don't know if they do that kind of wine around here. But we formed this, uh, this group, and it was called the International Dilatation Society. It lasted for about a year. Um, and uh, on January the 11th, 1978, uh, Andreas Grunzig signed the top of the cork, the AG. I'm a cardiology fellow at Stanford at the time, so I'm pretty low on the totem pole. But he signs the top of the cork as the AG as the CHBD. That would be chairman of the board. Uh, and then I signed the bottom of the cork, JBS. And they didn't know what to do with me, so he had assigned me the, the title of keeper of the cork. <laughs> so not a particularly prestigious <laughs> position, and I have misplaced the court, but I still have these pictures. So I just want you to know that I'm uh, living up to my expectation. When I came back from that, uh, I wanted to do, again, kind of what Billy said. I, when I came back from this conference, I wanted to build a catheter, and I wanted to test the catheter, and we had seen um, Grunstick perform one of these early balloon angioplasty procedures where he opened up a coronary artery, and now the patient doesn't have to have bypass surgery. So it's really magical, and I don't have any equipment. Actually, I don't have a Home Depot nearby, too, so that would be my, the thing that I would really look, look for. From now on, when you locate yourselves, you need to be close to a Home Depot, uh, I think, uh, according to Billy. Uh, some of the names on this, my black little bat book, uh, and this will be in June of 1978. The name there is Norm Shumway. That Billy knows uh, Norm. Norm did the first heart transplants at Stanford, uh, not the first ones in the world. Uh, Shumway was a very supportive person, uh, he's a, the cardiac surgeon at, at Stanford, very supportive of my efforts uh, to develop an angioplasty system. And then I went to the Raychem Corporation for my material, and they did just like, um, uh, like Billy said, he, he got his out of a Windex. Uh, I'm, I'm so much more sophisticated than that, uh, Windex, I mean, really. I would go to Raychem and I said, I need some tubing about this size. And they said, well, we're in a run now. We're extruding all the tubing to wrap the Alaska pipeline. And so to divert that extrusion, you know, for what you, how many? I said, well, I need about 10 feet. <laughs> and they said, well, uh, probably couldn't really do a special extrusion for that. But why don't uh, we see if we have material back in, our, uh, back in our warehouse that would help you about, about the right size? So they go back there. They find the tubing that is about the right size. And we use that to make this catheter up on the top right-hand side of the, uh, of the uh, slide here. And that's the first balloon angioplasty catheter which went over a guide wire that we ever used. We didn't, not that one, we didn't use that one, but that design's the first one that we 
uh, designed to be used in patients. Now that material, the plastic tubing came there, it was really cool because it was actually the electrical insulation out of the F4 Phantom. So it happened to be just about the right size. It had been irradiated. Uh, we could blow a balloon in it. But it also had flame retardant in it uh, because the F4 Phantom needs that in case of a crash. But patients don't need flame retardants uh, in their coronary arteries. So all that stuff had to be taken out, right? Then we have to get the, uh, the uh, we pass all the, all the, uh, well, you can biocompatibility testing. Yeah, the flame retardants do not pass biocompatibility tests, just in case you don't. No, that's why I'm really uh, giving you all the insights that you really need here. No flame retardants in your products. Um, this uh, catheter was tested in a baboon at the NASA Ames facility down at Moffett Field. Uh, the baboon had a 40-pack year smoking history, uh, just died of peanut butter. Uh, uh, the uh, the baboon fibrillated uh, while we were working on them and because of the way this catheter worked and the defibrillator at NASA did not, well it was a small defibrillator used for uh, mostly for uh, dogs uh, uh, and it did not provide enough energy to cardiovert the baboon, the baboon died. And the NASA really took not a very positive view about me uh, based on what had happened in the baboon, but we did an autopsy on the baboon, and you could imagine 40 pack year smoking history and, and died of peanut butter continuously, and that baboon had zero vascular disease. There was a, not a narrowed artery anywhere uh, uh, to uh, inside. So our goal was to test this and to test this concept and put the balloon in it and blow it up and show how that all worked in a narrowed artery, a diseased artery, because we're sure the baboon would have them, and that was not the case. A surprise, right? Uh, also, a big surprise for NASA that, I, that the, balloon, uh, the baboon did not survive. Uh, the procedure, now, the secret sauce in this particular catheter is not it moves over a guide wire. And so the guide wire is the thing that we're able to position inside an artery, and the uh, catheter then goes in over the guide wire. Think of the guide wire as kind of the railroad track, and the catheter would come in over that, and uh, that, I know it looks, it is, this was pretty cool. I mean, it grew into a really elegant uh, devices. And then that company sold in the, back in the 80s, um, it's called Advanced Cardiovascular Systems, sold to Eli Lilly for $110 million. And, uh, you know, sort of back in the $1980 range, that's, uh, that was pretty good. But after that device gets perfected, then uh, we, uh, I used inpatients uh, and a much better de design of that. And here's an example of what we could uh, expect uh, with balloon angioplasty. So this patient, John Smith, uh, admitted our hospital, Sequoia Hospital in, in Menlo Park, uh, California. Uh, and where the arrow is on the left panel, I feel like I'm uh, can everybody understand? Can, I don't know. I used to have a pointer and I feel embarrassed that I didn't Bring a pointer. Somebody must have a pointer here. JJ, come on. All right, so it's his fault. So then over on the left side, that's a narrowed coronary artery. Oh, look at you. Oh my God. Oh, I'm going to be so smart now. See, this is going to be. Okay, so this is a narrowed left anterior descending. Yes. <laughs> Who did that? Yes. Billy. <laughs> Billy. Billy. You're the man. Can I get a job? Did you decide on that yet? Or? No. All right. Um, so it's a narrow left hand descending coronary artery. And this patient developed chest pain uh, when his race car got up to 180 miles an hour. He was seen at Yale University, and, and they said, uh, you have coronary spasm, and that's a thing where you don't have a narrowed artery. It just squeezes down itself every now and then. And they gave him nitroglycerin, and he still got chest pain at 180 miles an hour. So he went to UCLA. UCLA said they did a treadmill test. He dropped his blood pressure. A treadmill test is a pretty common test for looking for coronary disease. And uh, uh, they said, you're so sick, you cannot have an angiogram. We have to go directly to bypass surgery. Billy, I don't know if you would go for no, bypass surgery for a single vessel. LAD. This was ideal. Surgeons loved this uh, setting, uh, this kind of a patient at that time. So he uh, signed out of UCLA uh, Medical Center, went to Hogue Memorial Hospital down in Southern California, and had an angiogram. This is the angiogram that shows this narrowed artery 
uh, over here on this side. I knew the doctor at the time, um, uh, Joel Manchester, and he said, uh, he called me up that night and said he wanted to send a patient up to, to have uh, angioplasty and that he didn't want to use his name over the phone because he's kind of a VIP. And so I said, okay, uh, I'm thinking John Smith, all right, that's great. But uh, anyway, he said his wife will be coming with him and he, he's married, uh, his, his wife will be coming and so, uh, and her name is Joanne Woodward. And so I said, I see some people know that, you'd be surprised at how many people do not know uh, the Joanne Woodward connection. So I asked, tell my wife that she, she was the call about last night. I said, well, somebody, some, I'm going to create a patient tomorrow morning, Mr. Woodward. And she said, <laughs> said, who is Mr. Woodward? And I said, I don't know. Joanne Woodward, it was married to Joanne Woodward. And she says, you are a dumb shit. <laughs> 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 and my wife, that's not usually the way she talks, actually, but this on this particular occasion. <laughs> so this was two balloon inflations takes this artery from this to this, and it never recurred without a drug, without a stent, without any of the things that we talk about that we're developing all the time now, right? Um, so I just point this out that if, if, if that's what happened every time, then we would not, the whole industry would, would not have developed uh, kind of the way it is. But it's really rare because most of the time when you put a balloon in this, even if you make it look like this, it recurs. Uh, over anywhere from three to six months, maybe after a couple of years. John Smith, though, did come into the hospital under this name, John Smith, and the uh, scrub tech who was doing the prep and the drape did look at Mr. Smith and say, huh, wow, you look like my favorite actor. And so uh, he said, well, who would that be? I'm glad she didn't say Robert Redford. That would have been a bad day. Uh, <laughs> But um, she said, Paul Newman, and he said, I am. And she, I think, had a cardiac arrest uh, <laughs> uh, on site. Uh, so anyway, the, uh, the, the concept of making a little bitty balloon to go in to fix somebody's coronary arteries as the way that that was sort of kind of all worked out um, is, is, a, uh, is because of the unmet clinical need. And that is, is so important for anybody at... Any, any angel investor. And by the way, all of these companies, so the first company, ACS, and then this company, Perclose, uh, which ultimately sold to Abbott Labs, made a, a vessel closure device here. Uh, it's kind of crude over here on this particular slide, but they all started with angel investors for really good reasons, right? What kind of investor is going to be crazy enough to do, to do this stuff. I mean, you're gonna invest in a balloon that's gonna, somebody's gonna put that, have they, have they been putting balloons in coronary arteries before? No, not really. In humans? Mm-hmm. Uh, what's gonna happen when you blow the balloon up? Mm, patient's gonna get a lot better. Yeah, always? <laughs> well, most of the time. Uh, and it turned out that 3% of the time we induced heart attacks in that era. And we never could have ex even evaluated that kind of technology in this current era, uh, right? But the, the need was so dramatic because the patients were having a bypass surgery, not everybody could, uh, could have bypass surgery in that era. And uh, it, it really contributed to something that's very, very special. The problem with that technology is we had to use some pretty big catheters in the groin and so they would bleed. Uh, and the puncture site to bleed, and so we developed this device called for, uh, they sold to Abbott Labs because we needed to close off the puncture site. And the ProGlide device here, or, or the Perclose device, also is used in TAVR patients, patients getting uh, valves, um, percutaneous valves. Uh, so this was sort of a, uh, the advantages of this device were totally unanticipated. Nobody believed that this device would be used to, to help patients get percutaneous valves place. So just to say that sometimes you develop a device and, and the original intent of that device, um, maybe it's not what's really gonna make the difference. So another, two other devices, and these are also uh, for, for Billy, he wanted to see really crude prototypes uh, last night, and so these are really crude prototypes. So this device eventually, the subsequent iteration of this, which actually doesn't look like this at all, sold to EV3 for $740 million, and 
uh, this device was predated that one. It was a device that sold to Eli Lilly for 120 million. These have cutters on them, so they shave out and clean up uh, 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 vessels. And we do that in the heart, and we do that also in the legs. So I'll show you some, uh, uh, just to, this is almost unimaginable, but the device that was the Foxhall device there on top, as crude as it was, uh, peaked out in daily sales of around uh, $700,000 uh, a day. We had a few $2 million sales days um, uh, for that company. But it, uh, because there was also, that uh, device was used primarily in the peripheral vascular space, and it is a, uh, a device that is shown in this um, uh, functions as, as a clean-out device, if you will. You maybe call it rotor rooter uh, So here's an artery that's completely blocked off here. No flow. Here we fix it. Uh, below the knee, no flow. We fix it. And blood flow is really good. Uh, see, I don't know if you guys get it. <laughs> All right, so here's, here's what happens with no blood flow. So this is a venous stasis uh, ulcer and uh, an ischemic uh, gangrenous region uh, in a patient that did uh, have hypertension, cholesterol, had a small stroke, atrial fibrillation, uh, was uh, not a diabetic. But she's 91 years old and she was bedridden on continuous IV narcotics and she was diagnosed as having profound dementia and would have to have an amputation of, of her leg. So we said, no, we don't think so. We can open it with these uh, other technologies with these catheters. And so we opened them all up. And her, this is after she had blood flow reestablished using the catheters. And you can see all of this stuff heals. In addition to that, her morphine drip gets terminated, right? And she's not demented at all. She is totally uh, alert and she's thrilled. <laughs> so she lived three years after, the, or four years, three or four years after this was fully ambulatory. Uh, and I promise you, had, had she had an amputation, th these patients don't get the DuPont, uh, you know, hyperflex um, you know, prosthesis. You know, they get one, they never put it on, they, get, they go to bed and they die. So it's a, a, effectively kind of a death sentence. So uh, this is fixing a leg artery. Now this is fixing a coronary artery uh, where we clean out this spot up here at the top. Then we uh, balloon it. We kind of mess up it, mess it up a little bit down here, and here's what happens to it later. It narrows down again where the balloon has been used, but where the clean-out device, the athrectomy catheter was used, it looks really pretty good. So um, this is a sort of a way to look at what's the best way to work on an artery, clean it out or squish stuff around with the balloon. So there's the balloon uh, there. So my position always has been it's better to clean it out. However, uh, what you, to clean it out, you'd need better visualization than we have had historically, and we can't just rely on, on, uh, on x-ray fluoroscopy uh, to do that. So uh, we decided to put on the uh, catheter, and this was the development effort that went on for a really long time, like seven or eight years, to put a, you, call, you could call it a camera, if you wanted to, a camera on the cutter, so you could see what you were cutting, and that way you, you'd make a safer uh, intervention. So this is a normal uh, artery, and this is what the OCT image, optical coherence tomography, is the way to image these uh, blood vessels. <clears throat> and you can see they have layered structures here that look very much like you would see them on histology. If you're working on an artery, you want to stay away from the layered structure. So this is going to, I'm training you now to be an interventionist, and then we're going to give you the tool that will allow you to do that. So here's the, <clears throat> here's the tool. This is the, uh, from uh, Avenger. And, uh, ooh, did that work? Oh, yeah, here, it's the animation. Uh, so this device has worked 100% of the time in the animation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now you're paying attention. See, I knew you would wake up eventually, so you would. All right, so here's the uh, device here. It's got a cutter on it. It's got a little balloon that supports it. It's got an imaging fiber mounted inside the cutter, and you can look through the wall, and this is the imaging that you get to see. Uh, out here. I'll show you what it looks like uh, here and how we use it. And imagine that this uh, uh, imaging element, sort of the OCT uh, uh, element, Kessel, Germany, huh? Um, uh, that OCT imaging element encouraged a physician in Munster, Germany to work with us. And so we go to uh, um, 
uh, to working with him and while we were there, uh, I want to take a picture of this sign here in Castle, Germany. Uh, someone else in this room can tell you the, the story behind that. But the, uh, the driver, my private driver, because you need a private driver in that kind of a situation in Munster. So my private driver is a subsequent speaker in this, uh, in this conference. You have to figure out who it is. He'll, he'll probably tell you. Uh, <clears throat> but these are arteries that we cleaned out using the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Pantheris device. And then here are all the specimens that we took out to clean that. So clean these arteries out and you get really great flow. <clears throat> and this is the great flow. It's this thing that helps these patients avoid amputation uh, or, uh, you know, become ambulatory again. And, you know, as we previously described. So let's look and see how how one of these works. And also, we, get, we do have, I know, we, I just saw the hands. We have a lot of doctors here, so this is good. Uh, this is an angiogram of uh, below the knee. Here's the knee joint right here. The angiogram is right here. And it's looking down here, and this artery is filled up with junk. That's a technical, technical term there. And you can imagine that if you go down in there and work on that artery, and you want to clean it out or do anything to it, you can... The, the cleaner device, the first pass, can be aimed at anything because it's so filled up. All the doctors here would for sure agree that that's just, you can cut in any direction when you get there, right? All right, you didn't bite on that one. So this is what it looks like before, and this is what it looks like after we clean it out. And so this patient, um, profound, we call it critical limb ischemia uh, for the non-physician uh, group. So this patient at rest, was having pain in their legs, could not sleep. Um, and now we're gonna st show the video loop. And now can we stop the video loop anywhere along the way? On the next slide, is that possible? Let's see if it works. Okay, stop it there. Huh. Oh good, all right, great. So uh, this is the catheter that's gonna work on that. That's the one that has worked every time in the animation. Uh, it has the balloon on the back side. It's got a cutter mounted in here, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to shave out any plaque that's inside the artery. And when you turn it on, and this is the image that you get, which you can get, no, you can only get this with OCT. Uh, this is normal artery. So in spite of what the angiogram showed, the interventionist, the angiogram <laughs> lied. Uh, it said it's everywhere, and it's not everywhere. It's only on the back side. So we're going to turn this device around. We're going to aim it over here. We're going to shave the plaque out until we get down and we see this, and then we're going to stop. So now we can just let, let it play. So here's the, this in the patient. So this is all normal. The cutter is sitting right here. You don't want to cut that. So we're going to turn it and aim it over here to the other side. So the layers go away. So this is all just atherosclerotic disease. Down here, a little bit of balloon. Now we advance that. We cut, 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 cut. Here's the normal artery, we stop. I would have maybe stopped here sooner. But that's normal. Now then you've effectively treated the patient, you're almost like you've taken them back to, uh, you know, sort of when, they were, when they were much younger. And so what this also does, it, it allows us to give real uh, tissue that the, uh, 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 Merck and the people that do gene expression analyses and stuff like that will be able to do that on a very pure atherosclerotic plaque without any normal tissue. We, we, gave, we had a deal with Merck at one time at Fox Hollow where we gave them a lot of tissue and the tissue actually was about half normal and half disease. Well, this is all disease now because we know by the OCT images that we do not have any normal artery in there. And that's probably not too relevant for everybody here, but you want to do gene expression analysis and extract messenger RNA and you put it on this chip, an Agilent chip, and you run it and here's what you get. Amazing, huh? Wow, that is so cool. Uh, it's meaningless, right? So you have to you know, uh, do some data processing. When you do the data processing, you get these heat maps and what it shows is that the diabetic patients here, uh, all the red genes are the ones that are upregulated, and so these are mostly the inflammatory genes that are, are pretty well known. The ones that are downregulated are green, and those are not the inflammatory genes. And there are a few diabetics that have no elevation of their inflammatory profiles, and there, there are a few non-diabetics that actually do. So <clears throat> this will allow us to um, 
I don't study this whole process and just make a whole lot more sense out of it. Okay, so the next slide is my scorecard. This is always the embarrassing slide. I hate to show it. I think I'll probably get by it pretty quickly. Uh, so this is really John Simpson, totally working all by himself. He's never had any help from anybody. It's amazing what this guy Simpson can do. Uh, really, really talented. So these are the companies, Advanced Cardiovascular Systems, Device for Vascular Intervention, um, Perclose, uh, Lumen, uh, Fox Hollow, uh, and Avenger. Uh, and these are the companies, this is what they ended up selling for. I take credit for doing this exclusively. I'm just uh, back to my amazing guy here. But if you add up all the numbers, it turns out to sort of uh, close to one point. $1.8 billion in shareholder value. Uh, <clears throat> all starts off with angels. Um, eventually, you, you outgrow the, uh, the ability of the angels uh, to do this. But Ray Williams is my primary angel. Uh, and then uh, also my ultimate angel is my, is my wife, Lynn Simpson. She has endured a lot. Uh, and I tell her that, you know, she's just so lucky. And <laughs> she says, nah, not really. <laughs> Uh. So thank you. <laughs>